Well, good morning, everybody. I would like you to welcome up to the front here, Pastor Ken Lehman. Come on up here, Ken. I know that a lot of you know Pastor Ken, but um, some of you don't. Pastor Ken, this is his third go-round on staff here as a pastor, right? Um, we recycle things what, here. At what Crossroads. does that mean? What does that mean? It means that you're, you know what it means? With all the young staff and pastors here, it's nice to have another old guy <laughs> up on staff. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I said in the early service, we are together in the Seven Decade Club. That's right. That's right. It's amazing, actually. That's amazing grace right there. Oh, that it God is. Has given yes. us that. God is good. I wanted you to see Ken again because Ken has recently joined us on staff, as I say, for the third time. And he is the Associate Pastor of Hope Ministries. Um, each time you come back, you get a bigger title. And uh, <laughs> he works with Pastor Stu. Tell us a little bit about what you do now, Ken. In a general sense, uh, Pastor Stu and myself, with Pam, our office administrator, we oversee all of the pastoral care here at Crossroads Church, which is a fairly large task, right? Personally, and Stu's over here, he agrees with me, we are overwhelmed. We're totally inadequate. Our role is to shepherd the flock here, shepherd the body, in the way of making sure that none of you fall through the cracks. Don't hold us accountable, please. <laughs> Pray for us that we would see teams raised up that can shepherd, because God's given them shepherded gifts, uh, so that all of us feel cared for and find ourselves being deeply rooted in Christ and built up in Him and declaring His glory through our lives in the way that we serve Him. Does that about fit it? That's awesome. All right. Great. Ken, Ken and uh, his wife, Neela, have um, nine grandchildren, yes. right? Three kids. Yes. And uh, you hope for a lot more, you said in the first Amen. service. Amen. May the tribe increase. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> it says in the Bible, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Yeah, and some of quivers are fuller, are bigger than others. You, you know that your quiver is full when it makes you quiver. But anyways, um, <laughs> let's... That's holy. That's, that's holy fear. That's right. Yeah. I got to remember what we're doing up here. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to have Ken. You know, when we, when we moved out here in 1997, um, we got here and our furniture didn't. And so Ken and Neela brought us into their home and let us live with them. And we became great friends and got to know this man's heart. This is just a great gift to Crossroads that they're back and serving us. And as I was praying for them this morning, this scripture came to mind from Proverbs. It says, the path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. And Ken and Neela have been on the path of the righteous for a long time. And that light of Jesus in them has just got brighter and brighter. And we get them at a point in their life where they know Jesus, they love him, and they love his people, and we're getting the best years of your life. So thank you. Yeah. Great to have you here. I want to pray for you, Ken. Why don't you stand with me? Let's stand together. as We just um, commissioned Ken, and we'll pray for Neil, and, and just pray that God would um, not only plant them here, but that he would just see that the ministry that they've been given just prospers and bears fruit for eternal life. Father, we are delighted today to stand in your presence with Ken. And, and I know his wife, Neil, is too. And Father, we, we pray for them today. We pray for them today that your spirit would rest on them. We remember, Jesus, that when you went back to heaven, you ascended, you gave gifts to people, and part of those gifts were gifted people. And you've gifted us with Ken and Neela, and we thank you for that. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your great love for this church and giving us a man after your own heart. And we pray as he, with Pastor Stu, shepherds your people, that they would do it with integrity of heart and skillful hands. Father, we, we commit them to your grace. We, we ask that your spirit would fill them, that you would give them creative ways to pass to these people. We pray, Lord, that you would give them the strength and the health to do the job. And we ask that in every way you would fill them with your joy and delight. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you, Ken. Thank you. You know, one of the things I like about working at Crossroads is you actually get up every morning and you get to go to work with a bunch of friends. And there's no better deal in life than that. We, I know this is hard to believe, but we get paid for what we do. Um, it's amazing when you get paid for what you're most passionate about in your life. So that's awesome. I want to do one more talk with, let's do one more talk with you um, from Deuteronomy. Uh, and then we're going to break 
for Advent, and Pastor Sean's going to walk us through Advent. I'll come back and finish off Deuteronomy in January. Um, but now, it's, it's crazy, because when I first announced in the fall that I was going to speak on Deuteronomy, I, I was sure that there would only be half the house left. I'm, I'm you to be commended for coming back. Um, a lot of people had no idea why we would ever open a book called Deuteronomy. It seems so old and so long ago, and yet I find it so relevant and so much stuff in there that just lays bare God's heart, and I hope you found it that way too. Um, I've tried to pick out some of the big words that reflect the big themes in the book of Deuteronomy. So we've looked at things like covenant. We've grabbed onto the word remember, which is just embedded in this book. We have um, thought about obedience and law and love and home and children and worship and loyalty. And I want to give you one more word today that's just a, just a key word that runs through this book like a river that just carries on flowing through the rest of the Bible. It's the word justice. Um, God's passion for justice is just all over this book, Deuteronomy. I'm going to read you from two places, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. Deuteronomy chapter 16 is the first place. You could pick a lot of places if you're wanting to talk about this topic in Deuteronomy. I've picked these two. Deuteronomy 16, and I want to read verses 18 to 20. It says this. It says, Appoint judges and officials for each of your tribes in every town the Lord your God has given you, and they shall judge the people fairly. Do not pervert justice or show partiality. Do not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Follow justice and justice alone, so that you may live and possess the land the Lord your God is giving you. And then just a few pages to the right in chapter 24, verses 17 to 22, which are uh, very um, familiar words if you read Deuteronomy. It says, Do not deprive the alien or the fatherless of justice, or take the cloak of the widow as a pledge. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. That's why I command you to do this. When you're harvesting in your field and you overlook a sheep, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat the olives from your trees, do not go over the branches a second time. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. When you harvest the grapes in your vineyard, do not go over the vines again. Leave what remains for the alien, the fatherless, and the widow. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. That's why I command you to do this. In the first set of verses I read you, twice over, it says, Justice, justice, and justice alone you must follow. In other words, justice should be a way of life. That's what it's saying. Justice should be a way of life. When you add to it what it says in chapter 24, you realize that twice in chapter 24, it says you were slaves in Egypt. And uh, I redeemed you from there. That's why I command you to do this. You put those two thoughts together, and you come out with something like this. Um, justice is something that's to be a way of life for all God's people who've experienced his grace. Let me say that again. Justice is to be a way of life for all of God's people who have experienced His grace. That was true then, and it's actually true today. Now, in order for that to be so, careful attention has to be paid to two or three areas by us if we're to follow justice and it's to become a way of life. Um, attention has to be paid to two or three areas. And I want to tell you what they are. The, the first thing that requires our careful attention is the heart of God to look into and understand and get a hold of the heart of God. I had a um, professor, he's now very old, but he still teaches, and I actually hope this summer, if, if I'm alive and he's alive, um, to go out to Regent College and hear him teach one more time. His name was, uh, is Dr. J.I. Packer, and a uh, wonderful man of God. And, I, and I, there's things he says that I, I just, I'll never forget. He said this on one occasion. He said, the subject of the old gospel 
was God and his ways with people. The subject of the new gospel is man and the help that God gives them. That's a great statement. What he was thinking of was this. The gospel that was preached that God has honored in the history of the church was a gospel that started with God. And, and just, it puts a spotlight on God and then somehow worked back to us. But he said, what, what happens so much today is we start with us and the spotlight's on us. And then somehow we work back to God. But he said that the old gospel that God actually honored in the salvation of so many people was where the spotlight was on God. The best hymns, the best worship choruses do exactly the same thing. They start with God, they put the spotlight on Him, and we worship Him for who He is. This is amazing grace, and we all are recipients of that kind of grace. Well, when it comes to justice, you, you start with God, and you start with God's heart. It was interesting because when I looked at this subject a while ago, I realized that in the Bible, and you could actually check a concordance, which is the easiest way to do it, or you could read the Bible from beginning to end. This is what you'd find out. I'll save you the time. You would, you would find out that in the Bible, there's over 2,000 verses that have to do with justice. 2,000 of them. That's way more than there is on prayer. That's way more than there is on giving, or way more on gifts, way more on almost everything. Over 2,000 verses have to do with justice in the Bible. When we look at Scripture, we find out that, that this is a pretty big agenda item on God's list. The inescapable conclusion, when you read all of them, is this. That God's justice is a witness to his character. His acts of justice actually witness to his character. You'll find in Isaiah 30, in verse 18, this statement about God. I'll just, I'll read it for you. It says, the Lord longs. This is a great verse. It means you. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. When he sits in heaven, he doesn't long to go to Hawaii. He's been there, done it. He, he doesn't long to have more stuff. He's got it all. What he longs for, what he dreams about, what, what the last thing on his mind at night, first thing on the morning, is he longs to be gracious to you. Isn't that a great thought? Um, then it says, he rises to show you compassion. His, his longing for you causes him to get up and show you compassion. For, for the Lord is a God of justice. The Lord is a God of justice. That's, that's where you start when you think about doing justice and becoming uh, justice, becoming a way of life, is you remember that we're dealing with a God of justice. So when you read all these incredible scriptures like Isaiah, or Isaiah, Psalm 146, I'll just read this one, but it's, it's a classic and there's lots like it. In, in Psalm 146, you read about blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord as God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. His spotlight is on God, and then he's going to tell you what God does. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. He, <clears throat> he sets prisoners free, gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. He loves the righteous. He watches over the alien. He sustains the fatherless and the widow. This is God, and then he says, here's the main thing he does. He cares for the orphan, the widow, the prisoners, the blind, those that are bowed down, and he actually lifts them up. That's his main deal. But the point not to miss is this, is that his actions flow out of his character, as it is with us. Our words and our actions come from who we really are. So we're dealing with a God who is actually a God of justice. And you see that as you read these texts in the Bible. But I need to say this to you, that the greatest display of God's justice is not the fact that he lifts up those that are bowed down. It's not that he cares for the widow and the orphan, which he does. It's not that his heart reaches out to the homeless and the disenfranchised and the left out, because it does. But the biggest demonstration of his justice in the Bible is what he did at the cross. If, if you read in Romans 3 about the cross where Jesus died, Paul will say in Romans 3 that God did it to demonstrate his justice. Now, that's really interesting because when we normally think about the cross and Jesus dying, we think about love. 
you know, for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. Let me tell you what I, I think was the biggest problem that ever faced God. It was not how to make this earth. I mean, he, he spoke and it was. That's amazing. He brought order out of chaos with a word. He brought light out of darkness with a word. He brought life out of death with a word. By his powerful word, he transformed chaos into order. And just by the way, Denise mentioned the Bibles. By his powerful word today, he still brings order out of the chaos of people's lives. That wasn't the hardest thing God ever did. And the hardest thing God ever did was not, not trying to figure out um, anything else. His, his greatest dilemma was how to forgive sinners and be true to his own character. That was a big dilemma. Why? Because God is love, but God is just. And essentially, when you boil it down, what justice means is everybody gets exactly what they deserve. That's justice. Getting exactly what you deserve. The homeless deserve a place. God's concerned to give it to them. The hungry deserve food. The lonely deserve to be set in families. Sinners deserve to be judged and put to death for their sin because God is a God of justice. So how could he love you and me and forgive our sins and yet be true to his own character where he said the soul that sins dies? Only by taking his son Jesus and putting him on this earth and then putting him on a cross in my place. And on that cross, him saying to Jesus, you be Dan Cochran. You take all of his sin, and I will put you to death for the sins that Dan Cochran committed. And that's exactly what happened. God is just and able to forgive sinners because somebody actually died for the sins that I committed, every single one of them and all the sins you committed to. It's the greatest display of God's justice and his wisdom and his love, the cross. So, when you talk about doing justice, following justice and justice alone, we don't come at it from, here's a good way to make the world a better place to live. We come at it first from the square that says, God is a God of justice, I'm his child, I'm to be an imitator of this God that I worship. So as an imitator of God, I do justice as he does, because that's his heart. And my job is to live out his heart in my life and in my world. Second thing you need to pay attention to, and I think it's highlighted in Deuteronomy 24, is actually the world around you. In the world around these people were refugees, immigrants, homeless, fatherless, orphans, widows, and he mentions that God does over and over in Deuteronomy, in effect to say to them, would you please live with your eyes wide open and pay attention to the world that's around you. It's interesting, when you go through Deuteronomy, there's just piles of verses that talk about this. And it's interesting because those who, for various reasons, didn't have a share in ownership of the land were still to be given a chance to share in the blessing of the land. The fatherless, the widow, the orphan, the homeless were, were not to be deprived members of the local community, but they were the objects of God's special love and care. Why? Because he himself was the father to the orphan, the husband of the widow, and the friend of the homeless. And if the Lord cared about such people, nobody in Israel must be allowed to forget them. You know, I mentioned last week, and Denise mentioned it today, the men's conference coming up. I want to bring it to your attention again, just for one reason. That is, I mentioned my cousin Greg, who works with Dave McLean. The two of them will come here, and Dave will speak. Greg's the front guy that sets it all up. He's a bit behind the scenes, but Greg and I grew up together, along with our brothers and sisters. There was a lot of us. We grew up um, down the street from each other, really. We were like brothers, and uh, we, just, we just did everything together in each other's homes, played, went to school together. Greg's younger than me, but his brothers are close to my age. 
And um, their dad, Bill, he was like a second dad to us. He did all sorts of things with us kids, too. So it's just like one big extended family. And then um, when Greg's dad, Bill, turned 40, they discovered a cancer in his stomach. And that cancer grew, and within about six or seven months, he looked like a woman fully expectant and went home to be with Jesus. One of the things I know he wrestled with was this. He had five children, Greg being one of them, all um, about 12 and under. The youngest, who was younger than Greg, was about six months, seven months old when Bill died. So he, as you would well imagine as a dad, is pouring out his heart to God for this family that he knows he's got to leave behind. And he left them behind with very little of this world's goods. None of us in those days had much of anything. And so you had Daphne, his wife, and five little children who were now fatherless. And how are they going to make it? Well, I, I don't mind mentioning his name. He's, he's a man of God. Um, his name is John Murchie. If you're ever in Victoria, and I, I don't know if it's Yates or Blanchard, whatever street it is, you'll, you'll see Murchie's Coffee there. Or over in West Van at Park Royal, Murchie's Coffee. John was a Christ follower when he owned Murchie's Coffee. And, um, and he, he knew the situation, and he went to Daphne, and he said, you know, you got five little kids, you got nothing. What would it take to support you for the next while? In those days, things were different than they are today. And she said, you know what, we, just to survive, we need $1,000 a month. And he said, I will write you a check for $1,000 a month until you no longer need it. And he made that commitment, and he kept it. That's doing justice. Now, Greg and Scott and Dean and Glenn and Cheryl, all of them, they, um, they were fatherless, and they knew the pain of fatherlessness. And when Greg comes, he comes as a man that's been through all of that. He grew up as a young adult and a high school kid and newly married as somebody that never really had a father in his life to keep him from all the um, cliffs that a young man could fall off. When he stands up, when he comes in this place on the weekend, you're talking about a real person that's really done life, that really knows God is good and grace is amazing. And uh, I want to, can I just tell you how God answered his dad's prayer? Every one of those kids loves Jesus today. Greg serves full time with Dave McLean in the men's ministry. His younger brother, Glenn, he, um, he worked for years with Willow Creek Canada. Scott, his other brother, works beside Bill Hybels in Chicago at Willow Creek Church. Cheryl married a guy that was a pastor, and Dean, he lives full out for Jesus as a photographer in, in Mission, B.C. And you know what? We, we always show up for each other when we're needed. They always show up for me, I show up for them. When my brother lost his 23-year-old son last year, Scott flew from Chicago to Swift Current, Saskatchewan, just to be there. And, and Greg, he impacts you. Did you know that? It was Greg and I sitting around at Tim Horton's here a few weeks ago, and me telling him we were doing Deuteronomy. And he said, I got a great idea for when you do children. Why don't you drop 1,500 balls from the ceiling? And I said, that's a great idea, Greg, because if it works, they won't know it's you. And if it doesn't work, I can blame you. But so <laughs> he still impacts you, you see. But I, I'll have to make this point, that God is a God of justice. He cares about these people, but he cares for them through his church, through his people that follow in the way of justice, that come alongside and say, you know, no matter what it takes, we will do this together. You, you actually um, are dealing with a God of justice who, who actually moves in our life in such a way that we become the dispensers of God's grace and justice, but we pay attention to the world around us. John Murchie hadn't paid attention to not only God's heart, but the world around him. You know what? Um, Daphne never would have been supported that way, and he never would have had the blessing of doing it. So we pay attention to God's heart. Pay attention to the, to the world around you. In other words, maybe, maybe I could put it this way. Live with your eyes wide open. Let me give you another picture of what it looks like. Not just John Murchie, but let me dip deeper into the past. Maybe one of the oldest books of the Bible is Job. And in Job 29, Job gives us a tremendous picture of what doing justice looks like and paying attention to the world around you. Job 29, this is what Job says about himself. He says, um, Whoever heard of me spoke well of me. 
And those who saw me commended me. Why? Because I rescued the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had none to assist them. The man who was dying, he blessed me. I love this line. I made the widow's heart sing. That's a great line. Um, I put on righteousness as my clothing. Justice was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. That's following the way of justice. When he says, I put righteousness on as my clothing, justice was my robe and turban, what he means was this. Every single morning when I got up, I put justice on and right behavior so I could follow the way of justice day after day after day. So there's two things. Pay attention to God's heart. We're going to follow the way of justice. Secondly, live with eyes wide open. Pay attention to the world around you. Three, pay attention to the salvation that God has given you. Pay attention to that. Don't forget it. Remember it always. Um, twice in Deuteronomy 24, he has to say to them, remember that you were slaves in Egypt, but I, I saved you from there. That's why I command you to do what I'm asking you to do. And the most frequently, I found this out, the most frequently mentioned biblical motive for doing justice is the grace of God and salvation. That's it. It's not creation care. That might be important. It's not making society a better place to live. That's important too. But the, the greatest motive that God gives us for doing justice is, I saved you. I rescued you. When you were on the outside looking in, when you were bankrupt, spiritually at least, I saw you and I took a hold of you and I rescued you and I put you on your feet. Now, you go out and be grace dispensers and justice dispensers remembering all that I've done for you. Israel's problem was <clears throat> they forgot that. And when they forgot what God had done, they forgot the poor among them. God has come to our help and intervene as our Savior, Deliverer, Provider, and now we act generously toward others. The gospel is not just forgiveness of sins and peace with God, thank God it's that, but it actually will always motivate a person, if they've really experienced grace, to seek justice in the world. So doing justice is not connected to guilt, but it's always connected in Scripture to grace. Don't do it out of a sense of guilt. Do it because you've received grace. That's the thinking there. So let me um, just land this thing a little bit, and maybe just by, by raising this question, where do you begin? So the Bible says, follow justice and justice alone. It says you ought to pay attention to the people around you. So how do you actually get going on this? I'll give you three things that have sort of been in my head this week. One, to, to start, you need, a, you need to make sure that you've really had an experience of grace. Have you experienced grace, really, personally? Not just sung about it, not just heard about it. Has Jesus come to you and given you grace? That's where it starts. I know in a place like this that there's a whole lot of people that come and go. And, I, and you're, you're, you're welcome in this place. And it's a good place, actually, to come and try and figure out where you're at. But there comes a time when you have enough information and you actually have to make a move if you're going to experience grace. You have to make the move. It could be as simple as saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It could be that simple. I want to give you a picture of God. Um, in Psalm 116, one of my favorite pictures is he bends down to listen to his people. When we gather like this, it's, it's like he bends down so that he doesn't miss one thing that happens happens. He doesn't want to miss one word of praise from your lips. One little bit of worship. He doesn't want to miss that. He, he doesn't want to miss the cry of your heart. He, he, he doesn't want to miss one person here that just with a whisper says, God, I need grace. I mean, he, he has full attention given to you today. You could actually ask him for grace and he would give it to you, but you have to make that move. It seems to me that until you've experienced grace, it's hard to be a grace dispenser. It's hard to do justice. Um, 
I think we need to become part of a caring community. This is a big community. I mean a smaller one. We, we tell our kids often that we become like who we hang out with. And that's true. If you were part of a caring community that helped carry each other's burdens, you would learn to do justice at that level and maybe blow it out from there. Um, that could be a small group. Pastor Sean, he will probably talk about that. You'll probably hear things about that in December. Um, follow that lead. It might be just going to a men's conference or going like last night to the women's deal here, which actually was absolutely out of the park. I was here all day yesterday. There were women here from early in the morning setting this place up, the chapel up, for a great, um, do you call it gala or gala? Gala. gala. Okay, not gala. That's what we'll call it, gala. Do you call it data or data? But never mind. It's <clears throat> we can get off track so fast up here. Um, and they, they actually, I think they stayed till almost one in the morning tearing it down. It was packed out with women. This was out of the park. You know what? Those are opportunities for you to go and find relationship, find community, get connected. If you go on our website or on the crossing, or even look at the bulletin, you'll find all sorts of opportunities to, to be with people and, and say, Jesus, I need to get connected. It's easier to do justice when you have it modeled for you and, and demonstrated to you in a caring community. So I think we need to be part of a smaller community. One of the things we throw around at Crossroads is as we get bigger, we actually have to get smaller, um, get connected. Third thing I would say is this. If you want to follow justice and justice alone, just learn to live with your eyes wide open. Make a habit of saying, Lord, could, could you let me see what you see today? Ask him that to show you what he sees. You'd be surprised what you'll begin seeing, who you'll begin seeing. <clears throat> Step into. Step into everything that he shows you, and you'll find yourself putting on justice as a cloak, just like Job. When do you get started? Today. Today. Right now. This isn't something that you put off and say, well, I'm going to think about this. It, it actually is today. See, this is God's priority, justice, following the way of justice. Some of us have lived long enough for ourselves, and now it's about living for God and for our neighbor. I would say, start today. I mean, you don't have tomorrow for sure. I, I, I love this story. I'll end with this, but it's a story of a man, a young guy named Tom, who's actually visiting. It's a true story. He's visiting an older man. And while they were visiting, uh, they were talking about using time wisely and organizing their day around God's priorities. The older man said, Tom, one day I sat down and did some arithmetic, which is an old word for what you call other things today. But um, he said, Tom, I figured that the average person lives about 75 years. So I multiplied 75 by 52. And I came up with 3,900. Tom, that's the number of Saturdays the average person has in his lifetime, 3,900. Tom, I was 55 when I figured that out, and I'd lived through about 2,800 Saturdays. If I were to live to 75, that means I'd have about 1,000 Saturdays left. So I went to the toy store, dollar store, whatever. And I bought a thousand marbles, and I brought them home. And I put them in a glass container. Tom, over there, they're on my desk. And there they were. He said, every Saturday, Tom, since then, I've taken one out. I've thrown it away. By watching the marbles diminish, it's focused me more on the things that were really important in my life. Nothing like watching time run out to help you get your priorities straight, Tom. Oh, and one last thing, Tom. Today I took the last marble out. And if I'm here next Saturday, I have extra time. What's the lesson on that? Well, when you've lost all your marbles, um, <laughs> no. <clears throat> The lesson is, get started today. Like, we don't have any guarantee on tomorrow, but we do have today. 
And what God takes is the set of the heart. Nobody should be discouraged because they don't have enough time left. I worship a God. Let me tell you about this God. He takes somebody, 75 years old, that can give them one Saturday, and he pays them like somebody that's lived 75 years of Saturdays for him. That's a story Jesus told. I worship a God that Peter told me about, where Peter says, this God, he, has, he can take one day that you give him, and he can pack a thousand years of living in one day. Nobody ought to despair. This is our God, and he's our guide, and he's the one we'll worship till the day that we die. Let's stand and pray. Father, today as we stand in your presence, we worship you. You are God, the only God there is. There's no other name by which any person can be saved. And so we, we bow down in your presence and proclaim that Jesus is Lord. We pray that you would help us follow in his footsteps. That you would help us to do, do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you day after day. Father, would you accept the worship of our hearts now as we set our hearts to worship you and then to leave this place to live for you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.